So long time subscribers of my channel will know that hands down my favorite planet in the solar system is Saturn. It's the prettiest, it has the rings, it has the hexagon storm raging at its pole, which can we just take a second to just stare at this because oh my universe, it's incredible. But it's not just the planet by itself that makes it my favourite. It's also got some of the best moons in the solar system, like Mimas, the Death Star moon, or Tethys, the eyeball, or maybe even Pan, that kind of looks like ravioli. But I want to talk today about Hyperion, the sponge moon? <laughs> I have never seen anything in the universe quite like the surface of Hyperion. These images are from the Cassini probe, which orbited Saturn for 13 years, from 2004 to 2017. And it just, it looks so much like a dried natural sponge, it's uncanny. And like a sponge, Hyperion is almost half empty space. It has a very high porosity. That's essentially a measure of how porous a material is. It's essentially a percentage of how much empty space is in a material. So in 2007, Thomas and collaborators actually used the data from the Cassini mission to estimate that the porosity of Hyperion was 42%. Are you 42% of Hyperion is actually just empty space? They calculated that by working out the mass and the size of Hyperion. From those two things, you can then get the density. And they found that the density was about half that of water. Now, the other thing that this data from the Cassini mission also showed was that Hyperion was mostly made of water ice. So if the density of an object that's supposedly made of water ice is actually half of water, then you can be pretty sure that half-ish of Hyperion is actually empty space. It's this high porosity that's thought to give Hyperion its weird looking surface. Compare it to this image of our own moon, or even Saturn's other moon, Phoebe. Poor old, very pockmarked Phoebe. They all have impact craters from the past, you know, four and a half billion years of encountering objects whizzing around the solar system. But the craters on our moon and on Phoebe are very different to the ones you see on Hyperion. Normally when an object like an asteroid or a comet impacts on another object, there's a couple of things that happen to the material on the surface. A lot of it is actually vaporized in the impact just because of the incredible heat that's generated by that. But a lot of it will also get excavated, i.e. it will get thrown out. You can really clearly see this when you look at craters on the moon, right? They have this very clear rim around the edge where material has been pushed up and out in the impact. And you can also see the ejected material that was excavated surrounding it, and even sometimes rays of that ejected material extending out from the crater in these sort of white lines as well. Now this will probably be most familiar to people if you think about what happens when you cannonball jump into a swimming pool. If you cannonballing at the asteroid and the surface of the swimming pool is like the surface of a moon, you can see there's the ejected water that gets excavated out. So of it which extends in rays in certain directions and we even end up creating a rim around the edge of our crater at the end. But the craters on Hyperion don't look like this. They're very sharp edge. They don't have that characteristic buildup of material around the rim. It's more of sort of like a little cliff edge downwards. And speaking of cliff edges as well, they're also incredibly, incredibly deep craters, unlike the relatively shallow craters we see elsewhere in the solar system. Now, when Thomas and collaborators in 2007 measured that poor porosity of Hyperion. They suggested it was that high porosity that could actually cause this weird spongy-like surface. If Hyperion is almost half empty space, then think about what happens when an object comes in and impacts with Hyperion. The surface is much more likely to actually get compressed and squished down, like when you press on the surface of a sponge instead of the material getting ejected 
out. And even if material did get ejected out, Hyperion's density is quite low, and so it doesn't have a very high gravity. And so any ejected material is much more likely to just be lost to empty space than to fall back down and form that characteristic rim that we see for other impact craters throughout the solar system. And the result of that porosity is therefore this incredibly weird looking, and remember weird is a good thing, surface of Hyperion. Now after you've gotten over the spongy-like surface of Hyperion, the next thing you will probably notice is that it is not round. In fact, it was the first non-round moon to be detected in the solar system back in 1848. Now, these non-round, potatoey, reminiscent-shaped moons are not rare occurrences in the solar system. Take Mars's moons, for example, Phobos and Deimos. They are very reminiscent of potatoes, but Hyperion is special because it is the largest of the potatoey shaped moons in the solar system. It's not technically the largest non-round moon, that goes to Neptune's moon Proteus, but that looks less like a potato and more the shape of a Dungeons and Dragons dice. Now the technical term for this potatoeyness shape of Hyperion is that it's not in hydrostatic equilibrium i.e. it's not big enough and therefore gravity is not strong enough to have pulled it into a round shape. That means that the pull of gravity is actually going to be different on different parts of the surface of Hyperion, unlike on Earth, which is round, and therefore on average, the pull of gravity is pretty much the same wherever you happen to be. Now, the reason that Hyperion is this strange shape is a very interesting question. Mars's moons, Phobos and Deimos, are thought to be captured asteroids, which built up like many objects in the solar system from the rubble that was left over from the formation of the sun. These bits of rubble clumped together over time, and in some areas you had even larger and larger clumps that eventually reached hydrostatic equilibrium and became round, but mostly you ended up with lots of smaller chunks there are all of these potatoey shaped things that now form the asteroid belts and the Kuiper belts. Now the majority of Saturn's small potatoey moons probably are captured asteroids, but that's not the leading hypothesis for Hyperion, and that's for a couple of reasons. The first being that it is so much larger than any other of the sort of potato shaped asteroidy things. The second reason is because it rotates very chaotically. It doesn't rotate around a single axis, say, like the Earth and the sort of Saturn itself does. It actually tumbles around through space with no specific axis of rotation at all. And the third reason is because of its colour. Hyperion is sort of a reddishy browny colour. Unlike, you know, the typical colour of most moons in the solar system, including our own of grey, 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 grey. But it's not the only moon of Saturn with this reddish brown colour. Take a look at Iapetus, often dubbed the walnut moon because of the ridge around its equator. Now, Iapetus isn't in shadow there. It's two-tone. One side is very bright and reflects a lot of light, and the other is relatively darker and is more of that reddish-brown colour, just like Hyperion. Now, the Voyager mission did a flyby of both Saturn and its moons back in the 1980s, and one of the things that the team noticed was that the dark patch on Iapetus and the surface of Hyperion were very similar colours. So to explain both that observation and Hyperion's weird shape, Matthews in 1992 came up with the hypothesis that there used to be a much bigger moon where Hyperion was, but it was destroyed in a giant impact with, say, either another moon or an asteroid or a comet. What was left behind was this giant chunk of debris, which is now Hyperion, but then also a lot of other smaller fragments of debris, which then landed on Hyperion's surface but also on Iapetus. One of the reasons that we think it was only on one side of Iapetus is because Iapetus is tidally locked with Saturn. That means only one side ever faces Saturn. That means it rotates so that it always keeps one side facing Saturn at the same time. Its day is the same length as its year, essentially. 
And that might sound very strange, but that's exactly what our own moon does as well, right? We only ever see the near side of the moon and not the far side. The first time we ever saw the far side, you know, was during the space race when we finally sent something around the backside of the moon. Now that hypothesis is very nice, explains very neatly the shape of Hyperion, the color of it, and probably why it's also tumbling very chaotically as well, because it's a remnant of this giant impact. But more recent work by Cruikshank et al in 2007 using data from the Cassini mission has showed that although the spectrum or rainbow of reflected light from Iapetus's dark side and Hyperion is yet very similar, it's also very similar to the reflected light from another of Saturn's moons, Phoebe. Remember poor old pockmarked Phoebe, it's the next one out from Iapetus. So a different hypothesis to explain the similar color of Hyperion and Iapetus is that all of the impacts that cause that pockmarked surface on Phoebe throughout so much debris into space that was obviously then pulled in towards Saturn landed on one side of Iapetus and then fully coated the surface of Hyperion. That doesn't explain though Hyperion's weird shape or its chaotic tumbling motion around Saturn. So the jury is definitely still out on how Hyperion has become the poster child for the weird and wonderful potato moons of the solar system. Before we get to the bloopers, a massive thank you to this week's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is a problem-solving website that gets you to learn by doing, not just by watching YouTube videos. It teaches you to think like a scientist, breaking down problems into easy to understand chunks with little interactive sessions that give them a nice fun application so you know how to apply the knowledge you're learning. They have loads of astronomy and physics courses that will teach you the basics underpinning a lot of the things that I talk about on this channel. If you like the sound of that, then go to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, that's D-R-B-E-C-K-Y, and sign up for free. And just for you guys, the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Sponsorships like this are great because they keep this channel going, allowing me to just chat science with you guys, which is what I love to do. So head over there and say a big thank you from me. All right, second time lucky for this video because the audio was maxed out on the first cut. Is that a bird or a small child making that noise? Could you stop? So in 2007, Thomas and collaborators used some of the data from the Cassini mission. Mission? From the Cassini mission. Now actually Neptune's moon, which moon is it? What's it called? Technically, Neptune's moon Proteus is actually the largest non-round moon, but it doesn't really remble, remble, <laughs> resemble. Fire away, fire away, take your aim. I am Hyperion. Iapetus? 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 <laughs> I, I guess we'll find out in the comments if I've been pronouncing it right this entire time or not. 